Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel and to a brand new video. In this week's video, you'll see me try a bunch of different techniques that I've never done before. And all of these techniques will lead to a really cool, unique red oak waterfall coffee table that I think has a really nice modern and minimalistic look to it. And hopefully the teaser didn't spoil the video, so let's go ahead and jump right into the actual build process of this coffee table. So this coffee table is made entirely from rough sawn red oak and the lumber that you see here is just a bit over four quarter inches thick. The thickness of these boards was consistent but the widths of the board was all over the place. Now first I need to face joint this to get a nice flat surface but my joiner is only eight inches so I couldn't joint the entire width of some of these boards. And an easy solution to that was to grab my track saw and with the ripping blade on the saw, rip these boards down the middle to reduce the width of each of the boards. After the boards were ripped, I just went through the typical milling process of face joining one face, edge joining one edge, and then going over to the planer to plane the opposite side of what was on the joiner. This process will ensure that all my lumber is square and consistent and in no time I had a beautiful batch of red oak boards. So you can edge joint one side of each board on the joiner, but you'll want to rip the opposite side off with the table saw. That way your board is completely parallel along the length of the board. And with the opposite edge of all of those boards ripped, it was basically time to go ahead and glue this thing together. But this won't be just any old ordinary glue up. In typical fashion of how I usually do things, I'm going to overcomplicate this glue up and make it take a whole lot more time than it normally would. So what I mean when I say I will be complicating things is that I'll be using dominoes inside each of these joints of the tabletop to make sure that everything is lined up properly. You don't have to do this, but honestly my last few glue ups have not been the best, so I wanted to see if dominoes across the full length of this tabletop would give me any better results. And in addition to that, I'll actually be doing the top of this in two different sections. So the top of this coffee table is 32 inches in width. So I'm doing two separate 16 inch sections that'll be glued together in a similar process a little bit later. But the reason that I'm doing it this way is because with 16 inch panels for the top, I can run them through the planer individually. That way I'll get rid of any of the glue seams or any of the lines that didn't line up perfectly with those dominoes for the first part of the glue up. Before we run those panels through the planer, we first need to build the sides of this coffee table. So we'll do that the exact same way as we did those top panels, only a little bit shorter. Because the top panel will fold in on the front and the back itself, the sides will need to be built independently. That way they can be put in the gap of what's left over. This will make a whole lot more sense here in a few minutes. But for right now, just note that we have two side panels that are a little shorter than the two top panels, which are on the left here. You can see they are longer than those. And as I mentioned earlier, before we actually glue this thing together, we'll run each of these panels through the planer to make sure that everything is consistent thickness, as well as getting rid of any of the gaps or the edges left over from the initial glue up. Once all of the panels had been planed down, it was just time to mark the center joint where the dominoes would go once again. We already saw that process, so I kind of skipped over that a little quickly. But rather than line these up vertically, I threw some clamps on the edge, squeezed them together, and they came together really well. So I will admit that I'm taking extra caution and extra time to make sure that everything lines up perfectly here. You can see by the level and the straight edge how flat this tabletop was. This is honestly probably the best tabletop that I've ever put together, but we really need to be precise here and make sure that there are no bows, gaps, or bends in this tabletop because this thing will fold over on top of itself on four different angles, so there really is very little room for error with this. 
In this shot, I'm ripping those extra side panels to a consistent width, and because these will be the sides of this coffee table, this will determine how high up the top of the table sets off of the ground. So with those extra side pieces in place, I put some pipe clamps to temporarily hold it in place and then use my track from the track saw to make a mark of what I thought was square to one side of the table. So I don't trust my square for something this precise, so one way to fix this and make sure that everything is square is to measure the distance from opposing angles and make sure that they're the same length. I couldn't sneak the tape measure down in there, so I cut a piece of scrap to the exact length on one side, and then I just used that to measure the opposite side. I was off by about a millimeter and a half over 80 some inches, so I just split the difference across the top pieces, and then when I made this cut, I just kept my fingers crossed that everything would line up. I believe that this is a trick they use for framing foundation of houses to make sure everything is square, but I'm not sure the proper terminology, so if you know what it's called that I'm actually talking about, drop a comment down below, because I'd love to know the proper term for what this is actually called. And here is finally a good look at the five panels that we have. So like I've mentioned before, these panels will fold on top of each other to form the box shape that'll make this coffee table up. Before I could glue anything up, I needed to cross cut those opposite bottom pieces to the same width as the long pieces I did earlier. So with the fence in the exact same spot, I cross cut them to width as well. So to get these panels to fold in on each other and line up, I needed a way to cut a 45 degree angle on each of the edges. And I felt like the panels were too big to run across the top of my table saw. And the track saw will bevel cut to 45 degrees, but I also wasn't confident in doing that as well. So what I decided to do was to use a 45 degree chamfer router bit and just trim each of the edges that would line up on the other edges, making sure that those would in fact line up to a 90 degree angle. Another benefit of the router bit you can see here, it leaves a nice crispy clean edge with no tear out and no burn marks on that. This worked incredibly well and I was glad that I decided to do it this way rather than trying to cut this with the table saw or the track saw in the end. The only bad thing about using the router is uh, pretty obvious by what you can see here. So it took me a few extra minutes to clean all this up. That did make a huge mess, but it worked out really well in the end. Once the orientation of the boards were all flipped around, you can see here how this angle is cut and how everything will line up and fold on top of each other to form those angles. To actually assemble these angles on each other, I will once again be using the domino to line everything up just like we did before. But there is an important thing to remember here, and that's that only some of these angles can be glued together due to wood movement. So this coffee table gets a little bit confusing because of the grain orientation. And so the thing to remember is that as the grain continues down the tabletop, when it folds downward on top of itself, the grain is continuous along the top and the waterfall portion, so the expansion and contraction will be in the same direction. On the other side, however, since that panel is independent, the edge grain, which is what you can see right here in this shot, actually goes the same way as the top. However, on the other corner where it matches up against the other bottom piece, those grains will oppose each other, so wood movement is an issue right there. Okay, so back to the actual assembly. Once the dominoes are cut, and one cool thing about the domino is that you can cut it on a 45 degree angle, but once those mortises are cut out, you can pop the tenons down in there. And now we'll go back to the opposing grains on the opposite side where I was talking about earlier. The thing here is that we want to use dominoes to align these up just like we did on the other sections, but we use the loose joinery setting. So if there is any expansion and contraction, then those panels won't be under any stress. So an easier way to think about which panels are glued and which are not, every piece that is attached to the actual table top, those will all be glued in place. And this works because the grain in each board is all facing the same direction. So 
So the actual corner of this table where the opposing grains line up, there will not be glue there. And that's where that loose joinery will be used. It was definitely tricky to get everything to line up and to pop these in place. But if you just hit it a couple of times with a hammer, it can be influenced to its final resting spot. Here's a quick look at everything once all the panels are popped into place and it actually looks like a box. So you can see on this side how that grain continues and that's what makes a waterfall table a waterfall table. Now there are several different ways that you can clamp these angles together. The easiest way that I found was just to put every single clamp that I own on this thing and then just to tap all the edges and the joints with the hammer to make sure that they are popped into place. I left the clamps on for probably 24 hours or so, sometime until the next day, and then I wanted to figure a way to reinforce the insides of this just because that side joint where the opposing grain was not actually glued together. And that's when I figured out that these expansion brackets would be absolutely perfect for this scenario. You can see here that they do allow expansion and contraction, but at the same time, they'll hold that corner joint tight together. Speaking of reinforcing this frame, it probably wasn't necessary, but I decided to use some of this excess scrap that I had to cut some 45 degree angles to serve as internal braces up on the inside of the frame. Like I mentioned, I'm not sure if this was actually necessary because the frame of this was super solid, but I figured that this couldn't hurt. Also because once again, the grain orientation of these boards is the same as the tabletop and the waterfall angle, you can attach those with screws and glue and any expansion and contraction of these pieces will be in the same direction as the top and the sides. We can skip over talking about how much fun it was to sand this whole thing down, but one piece that I do want to mention is how I sanded the inside of these angles. Whenever I clamped all these pieces together, I tried to wipe off as much of the glue as I could, but there were still some spots that I couldn't get. So all you have to do is take a piece of sandpaper, fold it over a block, and then you can sand all those glue seams out with no problem. For the finish, I chose to use Rubio Monocoat Bourbon, and I know that Rubio Monocoat has a high price point sometimes, but I used the 100 ml bottle, which is 20 bucks on Amazon, not including the hardener. And regardless of the high or low price point, Rubio Monaco is so easy to use and it gives me a much better finish than any other finish that I've used. Also, unless you want to put the maintenance oil on there, it really is only a one coat thing. So there aren't multiple coats of polyurethane with sanding in between. You put it on, you wipe it off, and then you're done. Honestly, I absolutely love Rubio Monaco, and these are my own opinions. I am not sponsored by Rubio, but in all seriousness, it is a great finish and very easy to work with. So the table is almost finished, but I didn't like how each piece set all the way down on the ground. So I wanted to add some type of internal brace and support to kick it upward so it set just a bit off of the ground. So what you see here is me taking this giant poplar beam that I've had laying around and in the way forever and milling it up nice and square so that I could cut some pieces off to make the frame that will go up on the inside of this thing. Once everything was milled up, I grabbed my palm router with the chamfer bit and I just barely took a little bit off of the edges so that that inside chamfer would sit together and there would be a nice transition where these pieces come together. Now since wood movement has been an issue with this coffee table the whole video, we don't want to just ignore wood movement at this point. 
So the frame pieces along the bottom of the waterfall have to have elongated slots to allow for wood movement, so I first took a straight bit, plunged halfway down with the router to make this slot, where the head of the screw will set in, but not go all the way through. I then took a spiral bit and plunged all the way through the entire board within that first slot. That way the body of the screw could slide all the way through and attach into a threaded insert, which will be put in the frame of the coffee table here in just a minute. Here's what that slot looks like after it's cut out. And you can see here that if I put a screw in there, it'll keep that pinned downward, but the screw can slide back and forth in case there is any expansion or contraction. Next, I painted these pieces black, mainly because I thought that black would look like a good contrasting collar against the collar of the table. And then it was time to put these in place. We need to mark where those threaded inserts will go. So I took a pen, used my hammer drill to mark that spot where that went. And then a Forstner bit can be used to drill down where the insert will go. Just be careful and make sure you don't go all the way through the table. Because to put a hole through the surface of the table at this point, well, that probably would be a really bad thing. So we just once again use the Forstner bit to drill out the spot where each of those threaded inserts will go. And then while vacuuming the chips, tragedy struck. Okay, so maybe tragedy was just a bit of an overstatement, but yeah, I vacuumed the setup block right into my dust extractor, which was definitely a treat to empty everything out and dig that out through a thousand pounds of dust. Anyway, once everything is lined up, you just take these furniture bolts, put them in place, and attach them right into the threaded inserts, which like I mentioned earlier, will pin this downward and tie it up against the frame, but also allow for wood movement, in case there is wood movement across the outside frame. You would think that I learned my lesson from the first time, but yeah, I did it again. I ended up vacuuming up something else right into the dust extractor and had to empty it again. Anyway, that bottom support piece that you saw there can just be attached with screws because of the grain orientation, and with those pieces on, that would finish this table up. And here is just a quick look and some final pictures of how this thing looks. Overall, I'm really happy with how this turned out. And this was both a fun and challenging build. So if you made it this far in the video, thank you for watching. Drop a comment down below and let me know what you think of this table. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how the waterfall looks and what you think of the oak I used for this. So once again, thank you for watching. As always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And of course, stay tuned for more.